Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us in our grand finale here. We've got a big job and not a lot of time to take care of this, but I know a lot of you are going to help us. Our job in this final session is to make Deputy Minister of Trade An's job easier. Okay? The more we can help him, the better chance he gets to take one weekend off. So this is our big goal, and this is how we're going to do it. We are going to work our way through the four pillars. You may have noticed in your program there are four color-coded themes, four color-coded pillars to the discussions. And we're going to very quickly work our way through those four themes in order to distill down to the essence what we really think must be brought up on the agenda when Korea hosts the G20. Okay? So this is our goal for this session. Now, before we go any further, to remind you of some of the things that have been brought up across the sessions in the last two days, let's take a look at this video of highlights. Welcome to the World Economic Forum plenary session. We should recognize the basic nature of the crisis. It's not just the financial crisis, it's actually a social crisis. 17 out of 20 members have implemented 47 protectionist measures. We have already begun very seriously about what value added we can make for the G20 process. We really need to be mindful of how recovery is taking place. People have forgotten how to make money in the old-fashioned way, so they make money with money. I'm proud to represent a bank which didn't take any government money. There's risk, there's opportunity. That's it. Okay. <laughs> I think there's a tremendous opportunity for us to be able to share views and ideas and, and try to help uh, each other in, in, in the current environment. On behalf of Korean business community, I would like to welcome you all to this Korean lunch. experts here in Seoul. And if you're going to Korea, where better to be than Seoul? It is our great uh, pleasure to welcome Prime Minister Han, Prime Minister of the Republic of Korea. The urgency of the challenges posted by economic crisis and climate change necessitate a comprehensive policy response. We need to use those resources more efficiently to ensure a sustainable global economy. Towards new drivers of growth. The year 2008 was uh, experiencing, you know, 6.23% of the uh, GDP growth. The new crisis gives future opportunity to actually accelerate the change. We are particularly delighted to facilitate an exchange between you and His Excellency Wang Chun-hai, the Deputy Prime Minister of Vietnam. In 2009, we're seeing the signs of the uh, picking up of the economy. This is that that is already outdrawn Paris Hilton and all the hip-hop videos on YouTube. This is a runaway hit. Who knew you guys were so sexy and so good-looking? Now, to... Yeah, go ahead, give yourself a hand there. <coughs> of course, our, our uh, guest of honor on the panel here is An Ho-young, who is the Deputy Minister of Trade for South Korea. 
But he's also, as they use the expression, Sherpa. He is the Sherpa to G20, and there's nothing bad about it. I heard of people laughing, a little bit embarrassed about that earlier. That's a, a, a title of great pride, actually, is a Sherpa to, to the G20. So welcome very much, Minister. And I'm also going to introduce you to our co-chairs for this World Economic Forum on East Asia and Seoul. First, we have Tansri Azman Mokhtar, who is the Managing Director of Kazana Nacional Malaysia. Thank you very much and welcome. We have, of course, Peter Sands, Group CEO, Standard Chartered Bank. Welcome, Peter. And we have Tarek Sultan Alessa, who is the Chairman and MD of Agility. So, uh, gentlemen and uh, fellow WEF members, let's get to work on the first pillar, which is leadership in turbulent times. And you will remember that category included a lot of discussion about rebalancing economies away from export-driven to more consumer-driven. It brought up notions of social safety nets, how, how long, fears about political will. Before we go any further, what I would like to do then is bring it to you, Tansri Osman, and tell us, in this category, what do you think the minister should be taking with him to the agenda for the G20? Okay, big agenda and almost impossible tasks, which I shall not even attempt to say that this will properly summarize. But what I shall try to do is give the essence of the last couple of days. First of all, very briefly, um, to, to say that three things when we started this yesterday morning. One, to recognize that the world is actually a slightly safer place in terms of financial and economic than it was six, nine months ago. So before we proceed, let's pat ourselves a little bit on the back to say, hey guys, you know, it could have been much worse. And some of the doomsday scenarios that we collectively predicted in Davos and, and before that has been averted. And why is that? And this is direct relationship to leadership in what was most certainly be turbulent time still is the notion of collaboration. That's one. Uh, the second point is that before we get too full of ourselves, which uh, the previous session I thought very good a Korean professor talked about the hubris index, a very interesting index, uh, is to be totally realistic and recognize that, hey, there's many deep structural issues that we've either not solved or potentially postponed or potentially compounded even. I think there's an underlying uh, feeling among many people that we, you know, we speak among each other the last couple of days that the medicine of 2008 and 2009 if unchecked, could be the poison of 2010 and 2011, which is basically the, whether you call it quantitative easing, monetary easing, printing money, whichever your inclination, is some of the future battles that we have to fight. So therefore, what are then the third bit, which is the longer term uh, solutions are indeed what you will cover, whether it's risk or green growth or future competitiveness and some of the other thematic uh, things that the WEF has put out. And hence, leadership, uh, this moment in 2009 is a bit like this uh, feeling of 1945 eh? and hence the global redesign. Eh? Uh, we are at that moment in time when the world got together and did Bretton Woods and a lot of multilateral agencies and decided that war is bad, whether it is now uh, the nature of war has moved to perhaps in the financial and economic space in terms of antisocial behavior that has happened. So really, in that regard, uh, my final point really is, I thought there was one interesting uh, discussion, and I think Deputy Minister Han was, Han was on it about between efficiency and inclusiveness, I believe, or representation. Uh, clearly, that balance will need to be struck, that you know, one needs to do what's right while trying to be you know, representative and inclusive. And I think in that regard, I think the time has come for leadership to step up. Thank you. Thank you, Tansri Asman. Uh, Mr. Sands, your contribution to Minister Ahn's agenda for the leadership category. I think you're going to have a very interesting time. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, to echo Asman's words, I think there's huge room for leadership. And I think Korea is being given a huge role in terms of leadership by the chairmanship of the G20. And as the G20 Sherpa, you're the person with the task of making that happen. 
two specific things that I think are going to be really important. And these are both in the category of everybody says the right thing, but will they actually do the right thing? And the first is on protectionism. Everybody is against protectionism. It's just that everybody sees protectionism when other people do it rather more clearly when they do it themselves. And I think the aspiration on protectionism shouldn't be just to resist more measures. That, of course, is important, but it actually should be to roll back protectionism and actually make the world more liberalized in terms of the flow of goods and services. So that's one area where I think the leadership should be about making people not just say the right thing, but do the right thing. The second area, which has a bit the same uh, characteristic, is around changing the growth model. The West has a major task to do in terms of changing its model, which is overly dependent on consumption and leverage. Asia's task is to find a growth and development model that is less dependent on exports. And here again, I think there is a tendency for people to talk about the need for domestic consumption and providing safety nets to enable people to feel freer to spend money and consume and so on. But actually, when you look at a lot of what is actually done in terms of policy measures in individual countries, they're tending to recreate the old export-driven growth model. And this, again, is an area where I think the G20 and Korea in its leadership role in the G20 needs to, in a sense, hold people to account to, to actually make sure it is a new growth model. Because if we simply sit back into the old export-driven growth model, we're just perpetuating the problem that we've had up to now. Thanks very much. And let me come back and uh, follow up for you, Mr. Sands, on that. On the protectionism issue, and we heard in the soundbite on the clip, and we heard Mr. Kiet say that at the very beginning, the opening plenary session, that 17 of the 20 G20 have already instituted 47 protectionist measures. What hope do we have? Can the G20 somehow give its membership air cover? What I mean by that is if I'm inherently a politician. My biggest concern is domestic audience when I get back and short term. And it's all good and well for me to talk noble and long term, but I've got to go home. And when I go home, it's going to be tough. And somebody mentioned that with Gordon Brown the, in one of the panels, I believe, Professor Lehman, you may have done that in, in one of the panels, that said as soon as he got back home, it was all about jobs for Britain. And it was very protectionist. What can the G20 do to help give its individual members some air cover and make them heroes for being anti-protectionist. Is there anything they can do? I, I don't think G20 can solve what is an intrinsically difficult problem. And it's not going to get easier, because as unemployment increases in various countries, the pressures for protectionism will inevitably increase. But what the G20 can do is it can provide peer pressure, so the leaders can put, in a sense, pressure on each other. It can also provide a prize so that a leader going home and taking some tough messages back to the home country can also say something about what that country is getting. And collectively, they can also provide a vision of what the world is trying to achieve. Now, it'll be Doha and the WTO where the hard fighting and argument and negotiation goes on. But if the G20 provides the leadership, Doha will work. If the G20 doesn't provide the leadership, Doha won't happen. Yes, no, Mr. No, Chris. Chris, maybe, maybe I can, uh, while I uh, agree with everything I heard from Peter as, as, as well as Azman, there is one real life example I want to share with you, which is that uh, many, many years ago, back in 1996, I used to work as a lowly diplomat working for the Korean mission to the OECD. 
And then one of the recommendations coming from the OECD was this, which is that one thing you could be doing in order to make uh, international trade more liberal would be, this, would be this, which is that in your domestic system, you could work, you meaning trade officials, so you could work as a guardian of free, free trade principle in the sense that whenever there is a new rule, new regulation, new legislation, you could just blow a whistle if it will go in the direction of uh, making it less liberal. So that was the recommendation co coming from the OECD, and uh, as a lowly diplomat, then I reported uh, copiously back to Seoul, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, when I was making the, rule, making the report, I knew it is not going to, be, going to be complied with. That was the situation back in 1996. Now, we have leader's declaration on standstill, which was made last year in November. And then what is happening is, this is real life example, which is that in the cabinet meeting, these days we are playing the ro role of whistleblower far more open. open. And then, and then other ministries, they, they take it in, in the sense that uh, because they knew that no other person than the president himself was involved in the standstill declaration, when we blow the whistle, then other government ministries listen. So while I know this problem of uh, 70 member countries of G20 having done one or another form of uh, quote-unquote protectionist measures, still, if you read deeper into the WTO report, then what it says is that well, even if there, are, there have been 47 different measures, quote unquote, of protection, protection, protectionist nature, if you analyze the nature of them, they are low intensity measures than high intensity measures. So in a sense, it is working. And yeah. then I'm glad to report it, report it to so you. So when you become the host, mm -hmm. will there be whistles given out in all the hotel rooms? <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> a little we, gift we, pack we, we with may, a whistle and an it. explanation. For well, as a, matter of, as a matter of fact, Chris, I will take that the idea over. Great. <laughs> so, yeah, um, the, the issue of protectionism is really one to, to be avoided at all costs, but I also think that the best way to avoid it is to, to really put it, in, put it in the context of an opportunity. And um, uh, uh, countries that uh, um, um, are protectionist are creating opportunities for others to be more liberal, to open up their economies, and to um, really attractive investment when other countries are closing the doors. So it really is, I think, an opportunity for 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 a certain a certain amount of protectionism is 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 politically um, 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 something that's inevitable. So we have to be prepared, uh, and Korea should be prepared to to set the example and, and see it as an opportunity to differentiate their country from uh, from from uh, from others. I think. The second issue is, is really what is the problem that led to this, this crisis? And when you see Alan Greenspan going up to the Senate floor and saying, we did not know that the banks um, actually held these assets on their balance sheets, you realize it's not an issue about regulation. We don't need more regulation. We have plenty of regulation. It's about actual governance and actually implementing that regulation. I think it's important that we keep that in mind and not have a knee-jerk reaction to it. Let's come to that in the second part, which will be global risks, and talk about how to perhaps mitigate or prevent those kinds of risks. When we look at this part, the leadership and turbulent times section, a couple of things came up that were quite pointed in some of the, the discussions, and I wonder how you might react to these. Um, for example, let me ask, zoom way back, why do we even care if Asian economies rebalance from export to a larger component of consumption? We jumped in medias rates. We jumped right into the middle of things and said, we care. Why do we care? Why not leave it alone? <clears throat> we should care because we are all in the same boat, I presume. And, 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 and the boat has been so integrated by the various transmission channels of trade. Is finance, it that we feel hostage that way? Labor, labor as well. Labor as well, because labor mobility moves from you know, want to opportunity. Uh, so whether we don't, even if we don't care, you know, it becomes our, our issue to care eventually. So, so really, I think the question should be rephrased as uh, back to you know, from the first round of comments. I think the, 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 the risk section is basically the, the flip side of the, you know, op the same side of the coin, the, 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 or the, the other side of the coin um, of the same issue. And 
to me, I just wanted to kind of link it to one of the earlier points about protectionism. I think the G20 in, in London in April was very much about you know, crisis managing, very much about you know, the house on fire, how do we put it out of fire first. I suspect in September is going to be some of that and only then begin to look forward. Mm. And perhaps by the time we hit Seoul in, in January, we should really be thinking more in terms of you know, further out. Eh? How do we rebuild this house? And what are the kind of rules of the various the tenants of the house? And we are all in the same house. Eh? This is quite clear. So in that regard, uh, Deputy Minister Ahn, whether you are the shopper to the, I don't know who's Edmund Hillary. Maybe there's no more Edmund Hillary these days. Uh, I think Sir Edmund has passed away. May he rest in peace. But to, to also state that, uh, to me, Maybe we have not, and the time is quite understandable, because in, if I can go back to 45, we learned the lessons of 30s and what not to do, and some of that has averted you know, the, 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 that spiral into gross protectionism. Uh, one, one thing that happened out of 45 was something like the Marshall Plan, for example, which is you know, totally audacious, totally big thinking, totally bold. I think in this era of... Uh, you know, frankly, uh, democratization of information and hence leadership. We don't have these larger-than-life leaders anymore. Maybe it's not possible to have larger-than-life leaders, but certainly we need larger-than-life leadership again. How the hell do we do that collectively is, I think, something quite interesting. For example, very specific then, to drill down, should we somehow tie all this domestic fiscal stimuli into you know, a set of protocols that can cross each other you know, so a China 546 billion whatever stimulus with an US, you know, 800 uh, billion. Of course, that has a risk of being a bilateral club, which it shouldn't be. I think the whole point is that you know, try to bring everything. You know, inject that with, you know, green, for example, the, which Korea has taken the lead. Inject that with the, the development part of the equation and what those not at the G20 table. Sketchy for now, but, you know, we, we have some time that perhaps this is a work in progress at Korea uh, as the chair, and that can deflect it and you know, raise the discussion several notches up. And, and as, a, as a species, we did it in 45. Eh? We, could, we could perhaps aim to do it in 2010. Minugi, coming to you for a moment, sorry to interrupt. Uh, just a couple, one more question here, and we'll try to stay on time and move to the second pillar. But I'll come to you by pillar by pillar so that you can have a couple of questions up here. Can, can I offer yes, a please, on, Peter. on why, why we should care? Um, the Asian economic development story has been an extraordinary achievement in lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. It was a model built, and this is a massively crude oversimplification, it was a model built on Asia producing and predominantly American consumers consuming. But it worked and it contributed massively to the welfare of a huge number of people. The one thing I think we do know is that model isn't going to be the recipe for the next phase of economic development. But there are still, I don't know, a billion or so people in the world in tremendous poverty. I think we should care about what the recipe is for the next phase of economic development. And it may be a very, very difficult thing to find, but the prize is an enormous one. Okay, to the audience here for a question on this category of rebalancing. And as I look and don't see any hands, I'm gonna ask one question that came up in the last panel I sat in. I'm looking for that questioner, but if I don't see him, it was a very pointed, very sharp, very specific question about solving the imbalances. And the questioner said, why not unpeg currencies? Won't that take care of it right there? Because if you have a pegged currency to the US dollar, perhaps artificially you're creating an export-driven economy when maybe things would rebalance on their own over time if you unpegged currencies. Deputy Minister, what do you think of that? Well, well Chris, I'm listening to all this uh, comments coming from my co-panelists, co who are co-chairmen, in the sense that Asnan, Peter, 
uh, Tarek, et cetera, et cetera. And then they, they remind me again and again that Korea is going to be the chair for the G20 next year, and then I'm going to be Putting the, the chair pressure for the next year. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, just wonder how many times I should be waking up from now until Korea hosts the G20 meeting next year. But at the same time, I was telling myself, this is right meeting taking place at the right place, in the sense that right, right place in the sense that Korea is going to be the host for the G20 me meetings l next year, and then right time in the sense that we are uh, seriously beginning to prepare for for those meetings next year. At the same time, I was just lis listening to those uh, advices coming from my uh, co-chairs, and then the first thing which comes up in my mind is this, which is that what is the level of ambition that G20 leaders have for the G G20 process, in the sense that Asman, for example, he said, well, it is like back in 1945, uh, recreating the world order. And then as a matter of fact, if the level of ambition is there, then I think we will go for that. But at the same time, I just wonder if we will be, be able to agree upon it. Let me try to be a little bit more specific about it, in the sense that yesterday I was uh, sitting in the first panel, and in the first panel I said in very broad terms that the agenda for G20, it is moving on from reactive issues to proactive issues. And then I didn't elaborate at the time. Uh, if I do it uh, just now, well, for the time being, there is very close macroeconomic coordination through the G20 process. For the time being, it is uh, for reactive purposes, in the sense that the financial market is in crumble, and then uh, the world economy should be boosted. So it is in those areas that the macroeconomic coordination is taking place. But at the same time, moving on, there will be other issues on which G20 leaders would have to cooperate. For example, where well, uh, already a large number of people have begun, began to talk about exit strategy. That is one thing. A large number of people have begun to talk about unloading all those assets which have been taken over by, by the public sector. That's another area. Already we have begun to talk about how to address the imbal in imbalance question, social safety net, those issues, those set of issues, which I would uh, define as post-crisis management type of issues. The thing is, my first question would be, if G20 leaders, and if so, how many of them would be agreeable to the idea of addressing these issues? So that will be the first question. And then if we can move there, that is to say, moving on from reactive issues to proactive issues, and then as a first step to deal with post-crisis management issues, then if, again, there is a, a sufficient level of ambition, we could agree to, to move even further on. For example, there is already a suggestion coming from Chancellor Merkel of Germany, and then the idea is, how about agreeing upon something called Charter for Sustainable Economy? Charter for Sustainable Economy. And then the idea is this, which is that, well, look at the, look at the situation now. We have this financial crisis, we have this real life crisis, which is worse than 100 years. And then let's just face it, in the sense that it is not the kind of questions which can be addressed through plastic surgery. It is some, there is something more serious, seriously wrong with the, with the rules and then the basis upon which this economy has been built. It is not sustainable at the end of the day. So when we do this business of providing first aid to the economy, uh, which, is, uh, which is in serious illness for the time being, we should move on to more basic and fundamental questioning about what, as G20 leaders, we should be looking at. So that is the idea coming from Chancellor Merkel of Germany. And then for the time being, there is agreement in principle that we should be looking at those issues. But at the same time, devil is always in the details. Last week, there was something called Schoffer's meeting in Germany. And then everybody agreed this is a good idea in principle. But at the same time, everybody said the devil would be in the details. So that is uh, the real life problem we should be dealing with. And then uh, about, the, about the detailed questions and then comments and then advices which I received from these three co-chairmen, including yours of providing fissure to the leaders, then of course I will take, no take note of all of them and then try to work on them. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Now, for the specific question that this gentleman asked, raise your hand again. Yes. You asked in the, one of the last sessions a very specific question, and perhaps Mr. Sams, you can address this. He said, why not just unpeg the currencies? Won't this naturally make the imbalances go away? And I don't mean just the trade deficit imbalance, but re reconfigure an economy, because you won't be a purely export-driven economy if perhaps your exports are a little pricier than they are today. I think that was what your point was. Flexible exchange rates can play a role 
but flexible exchange rates with uh, incomplete or uh, relatively limited capital markets can also create their own instability. Uh, and so the, there is a, there's a delicate balance. I mean, a flexible exchange rate with a, with a limited capital market is, is actually quite a, a threatening thing for a smaller developing country. It makes them very, very vulnerable to hot inflows and outflows um, of, of money. And, and so I do think that um, it is one of the topics that hasn't really been addressed by the G20. Um, thinking about the future exchange rate regime around the world is part of the solution, but it's a very difficult place to get to because you do need not just the exchange rate itself, but other elements of the financial markets to be functioning for it not to have unintended consequences. Asma. Yeah, the, briefly, I, I was actually in the session when you, you raised that earlier, but the, the, I think even more fundamental than exchange rate, which is basically the price of money, is the role of money itself. And I think that the fact that we are now, and for the last 30 years, has been in the, essentially, the, the, the dollar reserve era, since 1971, when basically the gold, uh, gold pack was left behind. And you know, during that period now, if we do not control the supply of money and basically the printing of money, then precisely Peter's point that, you know, especially for smaller countries where you have uh, flexible and open capital accounts, uh, flexible exchange rate and open capital accounts, that could be a complete recipe for, for disaster uh, for that country. So therefore, the deleveraging process, some of the tightening on this, what some have called the shadow banking system, is part of you know, managing that, that, that global liquidity with, with that system. But I think further out, I think the world hasn't quite figured out because, I mean, I think somebody mentioned money is not to make money. Money is actually a medium for exchange of real goods. So that big, big topic, but I think- That's Islamic yeah, finance. That Islamic or whatever, you know, what they call it, asset, Based finance that, that you call is, is, is one is one part of that, uh, to, to my knowledge. But it's a big topic. But I think the point is, exchange rates alone without solving that, I think you know it's not. It's, it could be it's potentially very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have a question down here on the floor from Professor Lin. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, first very important point: don't underestimate protectionism. It's never an opportunity. It's always a threat. It's like the arms race. It, it invites a retaliation. And I, I tend to agree with Deputy Minister, the situation is more or less under control, but it could get out of control very, very easily. The other thing, just to Mr. Sands, is actually the number of people in poverty are about 3 billion, not, not 1 billion. Yeah, but, you know, take 1, 2 billion. Uh, but the point is that one of the things that is very important in these growth models is obviously the issue of jobs. Uh, we have about 3 billion people who are poor right now, the population in poor countries is going to increase dramatically. And this is something, I mean, I know there was a session on unemployment, it's something I've not really heard enough of about the importance of, if you like, job creation over uh, the years to come, and that will have a huge impact on the protectionism, so on. But then I have another thing, which I think we really should be debating much more, but we don't have time now, but next meeting, is, is the idea that Asia should consume more, I mean, is, are, do we all agree on that? Is the consumption model, by definition, the right model going into the Yes, it's my first question of what's wrong with the export-driven model. Yeah, I mean, we had a very good, very good session on, on the green agenda, and I thought that was very good and very impressive. Then somehow or other, we, we, we go away from that. And I sort of worry when we're saying, people saying, well, you know, the, the Asians should be consuming more. Of sort of seeing, I don't think it'll happen, by the way, but it's sort of an Americanization of Asia, where you're going to have billions of people on uh, the consumer model okay. of the West of, or of the United States, which would be extremely dangerous. So I think we have to be doing a lot more thinking on new growth models that are both going to create jobs and that are not necessarily going to depend greatly on consumption that is going to have a very negative impact on the resources and on the whole climate issue. Can I just pick up on that point? I don't Please. think consumption need necessarily have a negative impact on the environment. It only does if you equate consumption with the historical definition of what it means, which is consuming physical goods and, um, you know, and the American consumption model, to put it um, crudely. But if you're going to have jobs, those jobs are going to have to produce something, 
and somebody is going to have to consume the thing they produce, be it a service or a physical good. They can either produce it for somebody in the same country or in the same region, or they can export it and produce it for somebody living somewhere else in the world. I think the fundamental thing we're saying is the model where Asia produced a lot of stuff that was consumed, particularly in the States and Europe, that one's broken. It doesn't necessarily mean that Asia should be producing the same things and consuming them here. I think actually the nature of what gets produced has to change quite fundamentally, partly for environmental and green reasons, partly because as societies get richer, actually a lot of what people want to consume is not things, but services of various sorts. And I, I do think that one of the parts of the Asian economy that is relatively underdeveloped is the services side of the economy. And I think that's one area um, that could, de could uh, use quite a lot of policy intervention in various countries in, in Asia to, to help stimulate the growth of the service economy. Mr. Minister, you had something to add? Where, where Chris, be between uh, 1 billion and 3 billion, I think maybe the difference comes, uh, arises because of this, which is uh, 3 billion people may be living uh, below the poverty line, but 1 billion people is a figure, as you know, who are starving. It is astonishing. 1 billion people out of 6 billion in the world, they are starving. And then it's, it's, uh, it's unconscionable. So we are very much conscious of the problem. And then, as a matter of fact, uh, in the G20, then uh, there was one uh, self-questioning after the London summit, which was maybe we have not a, a, a thought to have done sufficient of things with respect to least developed countries. So there is the first one. My, my second point is with res respect to the question coming from the audience about the pegging the money. I didn't forget about the question in my previous intervention. I just thought my intervention was getting too long. So <laughs> I, I intentionally uh, didn't respond to the point. But the, but the point is that, well, again, it, it gets back to the point of the level of ambition for the G20 process in the sense that for the time being, when it comes to the reform of the financial regulation, it is narrowly focused upon 47 ex, uh, point action plan, which is highly technical matters. But at the same time, we know, even after all those 47 point action plans have been completed, both collectively and then domestically, then we know that we will have to still deal with a large number of financial questions, with including exchange rate, but not only uh, ex exchange rate, but extreme volatility in capital movement as well. For example, where well, uh, Prime Minister Han, he was talking about IIF meeting which took place over the weekend in Beijing, China, and one of the IIF IF, IF figures, which was very shocking to me, was this, which is that back in 2007, the capital, net capital movement to emerging markets from advanced economies, it was no less than $950 billion. $950 billion in 2007. Last year, do you know how much it has, it has been reduced? It reduced to $150 billion. From $950 billion down to $150 billion in two years' time. This is enormous high degree of volatility, which is uh, working as an enormous pressure upon emerging economies. And then all these issues, exchange rate, volatility, volatility in the capital market, et cetera, et cetera, these issues will not be addressed even after the complete implementation of those 47 action plan, uh, point action plans. So the question is, if G20 leaders would have sufficient stomach to address these next generation issues after taking care of the first generation issues, Korea, for one, we have the stomach. But you at the have same the time, stomach. We have the stomach, okay. but at the same time, uh, we will have to see if other leaders have the same stomach and appetite as well. All right, here's the appetite for the second pillar right. here. Do you have enough, Mr. Minister, from us for the first one so that we can move to the second pillar here? We, I'm very, very satisfied. Fantastic. With the first now we're going to move to the second pillar, which was global risks. Now, the WEF did a uh, series of um, questions, video questions for people that they put up on YouTube. And you could see it as a kind of vote. And the question was, do you think geopolitical risks are the bigger risk or geofinancial risks are the bigger risks? Put another way, do you think a North Korea risk is bigger than a meltdown due to mortgage-backed derivatives, for example? And so far, the geopolitical is winning. So for the minister on his agenda, what I'd like to come to you, and if I could come to you first, uh, Tarek Sultan, what do you think he should have on his agenda talking about global risks? Should it be geopolitical? Should it be financial? Should it be something else? Well, I, I think the geopolitical issues will, will basically 
address themselves. I think the way these things work out, you know, as the meeting get, gets close, uh, there'll be issues that are topical that will be, uh, you know, a risk that will need to be addressed. But I think the, the main issues for me are issues regarding uh, regulation and what's next. I mean, governments have spent uh, a huge amount of, uh, of money trying to um, turn this uh, situation around. And uh, the question is, you know, is that going to work? What's next? You know, is, has the government really um, finished or, or consumed all of its resources? How are we going to get through this? And, you know, I think those two issues uh, still in the back of my mind are issues that need to be uh, addressed. Aswad, what would you have him put there to, on the risk category? Let me just move this mic a little closer. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, I was actually on, on the panel on the risk, uh, which, which we started. And I think, um, I think everybody recognizes the, the geopolitical risk, but you know, that's, how, how shall I say, fairly binary. You know, yes, no. Uh, but this geofinancial risk is, is certainly uh, there prevalent all the time. Um, so, so what does he take as an agenda item? Well, the... Certainly, the geofinancial uh, at this stage of the global recovery, uh, you know, would be at the forefront. I would have thought, where where G20 was in April and then September, and leading up to that. And and uh, but I think beyond that is really the geopolitical risk. Is maybe shorthand for is the world, I don't know, inclusive enough or reaching out enough? And I think we've not spoken about about the Obama administration and the work that is going out, I mean, to the Muslim world, uh, to other parts of the world. And really, I mean, it's not just North Korea, Iran, and other places. And I think uh, really, I think that part, you know, clearly the leadership of that and how you know, China is the other you know, major actor, if you like, uh, in, in the overall scheme, uh, comes together really. So I would, I would say geofinancial definitely in the forefront, notwithstanding your poll, and geopolitical, really, I think that, that reaching out and inclusiveness, I think the, the, the mention about the three billion and indeed the one billion that are starving. Uh, and, and actually, while I have the mic, the very briefly, uh, uh, Deputy Minister, the, to me, three things. That Korea, in addition to all these other global issues, and there's so many of them, three things stand out to me. And Korea really you know, has great credibility because of your track record to all the countries in the world who are developing or, or less developed or starving even, you have shown how in 40, 50 years, you, you have taken yourself up in, into the ranks of the developed world. That's a huge, huge achievement and a huge beacon of uh, you know, inspiration. And so, so certainly we will look to you not to forget that part of the world, the three billion. Okay? And they will look to you uh, being at the table and chairing the G20. I Second, you, secondly, the, the green, green growth part, which I think uh, the President's fiscal stimulus is, I think among all the OECD countries, this is actually the biggest in terms of percentage. He has made that the central part of his fiscal stimulus. Again, I think you had the stomach for it and, and, and you know, so again. And finally, the crisis management part, which uh, I think, you know, the 98 crisis, Malaysia was part of that too, of course, you know, and how we recover, I think, certainly. So those are the three things. I would end on, on my, on my Let's side. come back to the green growth, because that's the next category. So this one is well, only... I thought we finished the fourth one. <laughs> no, no, no. We're on to global risks, number two here. Number, so on the global risk category, geopolitical, geofinancial, uh, help me if you could, somebody with a question. How do we turn that into an action point? What do you want him to get in order to reduce global financial risk or geopolitical risk? What are you asking for? A new framework? A new way of working? A new body? What are you asking for? Is there something that we can say again? Promote trade. Promote trade. Here's one suggestion. How about over here? What's something that we can give him that would be specific to ask for to help mitigate risk? Say that again? Exchange rate system. Global exchange rate system. How about over here? Anything over here? Financial education. What else? Somebody have another one? This won't be an auction, but I'm just looking for a couple of ideas to give to him. Because we talk about bodies, you know, to help, new frameworks of bodies. 
but they're pretty difficult, aren't they? And we have a lot sure of existing is. bodies as it is. Right. Should we look to build a new body, or should we work with the old bodies? I'm hoping to work with an old body myself, but. Well, uh, talking about the risk, I think uh, the, the risks are interrelated in a sense, in the sense that, uh, well, Asman, he was talking about the experiences of uh, financial crisis back in late 1990s, and then what we experienced was that, of course, the risk, the first risk started in the, in the form of financial risk, and then it moved on to economic risk, and then economic risk moved on. Very early, it moved on to social risk, and then finally it moved on to, to political risk. And then when we talk, talk about the political risk, then of course we uh, think mainly in terms of domestic political risk, but at the same time, if things get to such a point, then it can develop into geopolitical risk as well. So in a sense, we should be conscious to the fact that all these risks are all, in, are all interrelated. But at the same time, uh, what we also should be thinking about is uh, this broad question about the global governance, in the sense that in the first session, first panel, we were discussing about, about global, global governance question a little bit. And, th and then what I suggested was that there are a large number of institutions responsible for global governance question, and then at the same time, there should be good division of labor among those uh, institutions for global governance. So the way I, I look upon it, uh, G20 for the time being, it is narrowly focused upon macroeconomic and, uh, and the financial matters. So, so far as that is the case, then I think geopolitical risks would not be the things which would be directly and immediately addressed by the G20 process. But at the same time, I think G20 leaders should be conscious of the fact that all the risks are interrelated. And then getting back to those uh, specific ideas about financial education, uh, fight against uh, protectionism, et cetera, et cetera, we will take a note of them and then try to share them with the other G20 leaders as specific measures we can take in order to reduce the level of uh, geo-financial risks. Thank you, Mr. Minister. And what do you expect, realistically, to come out of the next G20 summit mm -hmm. in terms of any change in global financial governance? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let us first talk about uh, financial risk, for example. Uh, there has been something called Financial Sector Assessment Program, FSAP. And then the idea is, and then it is uh, IMF-centered uh, uh, exercise. And then, Chris, you are right in the sense that, well, uh, if there is an institution, then we, we will have to try to use them. And then, in fact, there is IMF. In fact, there, is, uh, there has been FSAP program. The problem with the, with the FSAP program was it was not mandatory in the sense that if, a, if, if somebody agreed to subjecting it itself to the FSAP program, then IMF worked with those countries. But if some other countries stayed away from those programs, then uh, IMF didn't look at those countries. And then that is the reason. One of, I wouldn't say the reason, but one of the reasons why these financial risks could not be spotted or could not be have, uh, have been acted upon you know, in a more timely manner. But at the same time, other than IMF, we have all other kinds of institutions which has already been there, but which has not been empowered sufficiently. And then I think in the short run, what we should be doing through the G20 process is to uh, have better appreciation of all those institutions, both mandates and functions and staffing, all those issues, and try to empower them so that uh, they will be doing the role they were supposed to do. And then in that context, one of the very important institutions that we should be looking at is an institution called FSB, Financial uh, Stability Board. And then that Financial Stability Board used to have very limited membership, and then it is through the G20 process that the membership has been extended rather broadly to include all the G20 member countries. Some of them fly first class, some of them fly second uh, business class, some of them fly third class, economic class, in the sense that some of them have three seats, some of them have two seats, some of them have one seat, but even then, everybody is, is in. And then the next problem we should be looking at is that FSB used to have seven staff members, and then it has been charged with all those uh, very important uh, duties to be done, and then still they have seven staff members, and then the first thing we should be doing would be to increase the n number of the staff for the FSB. Okay, for the sake of time, let's move on to the green growth, sustainability section. Now, we all, for people, so many times in the many sessions, no matter where you go on the planet talking about this, it's as though we uh, talk is cheap, frankly. We say we all want to do the right thing, we think we know what the right thing is, but actually doing it is another thing entirely. And we heard your prime minister 
say that there, Korea is going to spend 40 billion U.S. dollars over the next four years to try to create nearly a million jobs in a green economy. Now, that, that's not cheap. That's not talk. That's some action. Should there be, and let me put the question to you, Mr. Sands, should there be a kind of formula? You know, in the U.K., Tesco has started labeling foods with a carbon footprint. Should there be something similar for countries? Should there be some formula that we say we must spend X percentage of GDP on green economy? What should be done, if anything, to promote working through G20 a sustainable or green growth economy? Actually, I would be uh, somewhat skeptical about sort of reaching to uh, sort of single solutions that um, can be applied universally everywhere in, in, akin to the sort of food labeling type thing. I think we are on a journey in terms of wrestling with the issues around reconciling economic growth, making people have wealthier, healthier, more enjoyable lives, and making those lives have less impact on the planet. And that's a very complicated process. And I think some of the things that have been pioneered here in Korea are, are, are great examples of um, tackling these sorts of issues. Uh, I suspect that in the G20, one of the most valuable things that can be done is for there to be a sharing and discussion of what individual countries are trying to do and the trade-offs they're making rather than leaping as if we've immediately got the answer. Because there's some very, very difficult trade-offs here. And also the underlying technologies we're wrestling with are, are, are changing all the time. So I think it's, it's sort of premature to, to say, we know what the answer is, and now we just measure people's progress towards it. Um, but I do think the, the G20 can be a, a particularly valuable in in helping the discussion around the trade-offs between economic growth and, and being green, because that's where some of the really difficult issues are. Tarek Sultan, in the Middle East, sometimes accused of very high carbon footprint just because of the geography and some of the places in terms of the need, and also for water management, a very big issue. What do you see coming from your particular vantage in terms of huge amounts of expenditure, or maybe a small percentage amount, that should be enforced as a kind of peer pressure amongst the G20 to, to create a green and sustainable economy? Well, again, I think um, you know, Abu Dhabi is really showing some leadership in this, uh, in this uh, regard. Uh, they're developing a city from scratch called the Mustache City, which is uh, going to be designed from the bottom up to be a carbon uh, neutral city. So I think uh, uh, the Middle East is taking a leadership role. There's a lot of infrastructure going uh, uh, in the ground there, and I think it's a great testing ground for some of these new technologies, especially uh, as they relate to water, um, which uh, should be um, uh, shared. I think a key thing for the agenda item, though, is to really focus on the area of collaboration uh, so that we can uh, learn from each other's uh, technologies. And I think there's a lot going on uh, across the board that people aren't aware of, and there's no single point of contact mm -hmm. uh, for that. So I think there's a lot of wasted, um, uh, wasted effort, and I, I think that's not the way to go when you have technologies that are still, um, in, is still not proven and need to be helped along. So I think we need to focus on the micro, um, also incentives, um, and less on sort of the big picture sort of targets that really uh, um, get people's uh, uh, you know, to, to be defensive about the idea of uh, green technology. Just focus on the business opportunities and let the private uh, sector uh, move it along. So do you see the G20 as creating a sharing mechanism, a, a really formalized me mechanism to share these best practices? Is that the idea? I, I think that would be a great uh, great start. Asma. Yeah, the very quickly on some of the one-on-ones and bilateral meetings, I think on the green subject, I think many business leaders appear to be saying, I think this is all well and fine, but a lot of incentives will need to be put in because what you know, economists among us will call the externalities of you know uh, the the problems of of uh, going green. Because so therefore, the role of governments 
in terms of providing incentives and enforcement. Uh, Kazana, very briefly, we, we chose China actually to, to roll out in 10 cities waste to energy uh, incineration, partly because once the Chinese were convinced that this is what, what they wanted to do, first the incentives and two the enforcement. So that's one. And then I think on a, on a broader cross-border market, really, the whole carbon credit movement, you know, whether I think perhaps the time is right to, to upgrade that. I mean, this is a you know, fairly complex subject. Many, many in the audience would know better on that. So I would have thought you know, on both. And then thirdly, the, the, the other lever is basically technology. You know, how fast can that, that, that step to the plate? Thank you. Thanks very much. We're really running out of time now. So is there a question on green, a single burning question, and something on the agenda that the minister should take with him that you've not heard? Going once, twice. Now, for only two minutes left, the world of competition and competitiveness, the world of growth drivers in two minutes. So if I might come to you now, Mr. Sands, some of the things were brought up, I believe it was Dominic from uh, McKinsey, who had a great five points, he was very succinct, and one of the clearest I had heard, he said, listen, here are the growth drivers for Asia. Healthcare, education, climate change, infrastructure, and one billion new consumers. Anything else you would add as growth drivers, Azman, Mr. Sands? Well, uh, in one and a half minutes, just, just to say that the, the, yeah, all those that you listed are, are, are you know, necessary and you know, quite micro in that sense, but I think the underlying uh, base that we need to start with is you know, this bit about collaboration, solve this crisis, uh, you know, the, the more balanced global governance that's been talked about. Asian integration, we didn't talk too much in this final session, but really I think that agenda has to run concurrently with uh, Asian integration, but global kind of a partnership, if you like, um, you know, because otherwise the Asia, I think, is, is in a relatively better position. I think that has to be recognized. Uh, then Asia can go on its own, but it, it, it won't either it won't be able to or doesn't want to. Uh, really, and otherwise, the global story is going to be suboptimal. And I think that's at the heart of the whole G20 movement, a more balanced global governance. So really about competitiveness, I think those kind of basic public goods will need to be in place. And then we can start talking about, I'm sure there's many opportunities and indeed, you know, that list by Dominic from McKinsey is actually a, a list, a lot of you know, basic needs, actually, healthcare, education, environment, infrastructure, actually. And, and indeed, uh, the billion, I think this is the bit middle billion. It's not, not just the bottom billion, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. Thank you. Can, can I just add something? Sure. Um, uh, a, a, a plea, I suppose, which is we have seen markets fail but let's not lose faith in markets, because if we lose faith in markets, we will end up in a sort of, well, normally what happens is people put impediments to markets because actually it's a good disguised way of imposing protectionism um, and, and reducing competition. And competition and markets are a very powerful way of promoting economic and growth and development. And I think there is a little bit of a risk that um, in reaction to the very real trauma of this enormous, enormous sort of financial and economic crisis is that we lose faith in mechanisms of economic growth that have proved very powerful and successful. And my second plea is that some of the things that have had to be done to um, intervene in the crisis um, have the potential to sow the seeds for the next crisis. And I'm talking about the degree of liquidity provision, quantitative easing and so on, the plethora of guarantees, financial guarantee systems that have been sprung up across the world. And I do think that one of the agenda items that will probably be around the time that Korea takes on the G20 will be, how, how do you unwind some of that? Because if you don't unwind some of that, you are, I think, inadvertently laying the seeds of future problems. This is the so-called exit that so many people have worried about in the last two days? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the easy bit is the tarp, frankly. 
that paying back some capital is the easy bit. The hard bit is unwinding the whole arrangement around liquidity provision and guarantees and so on, because there's a real sort of prisoner's dilemma problem of um, who moves first. And this is somewhere where there is going to need to be a d considerable international coordination for that to work effectively. Minister Ahn, I'm going to give the last one minute here to you. We've tried to help you get a weekend off. We've tried <laughs> to give you some ideas to take in your Sherpa duties. How did we do? Right. Well, yesterday, if uh, any one you, uh, of you has been to the Korea lunch, then what I said was that, uh, well, there was one question coming from the floor. And then the question was, is Korea ready to take up the chairmanship of G20? And then I really appreciated that question. And then I answered by saying that, well, uh, we wouldn't say that we, by one country, would be ready to take up the leadership, uh, the challenge of leadership, but at the same time, we wouldn't be alone in the sense that there is something called uh, Troika, which is uh, present chair, chair country, former chair country, and then coming, the, the chair country for the next year. And then we will depend upon other G20, uh, G20 member countries, and we will, we will be diligent in going out and then listen from other member countries as, w as well. And then there was one essential element which I forgot to mention yesterday, which is World Economic Forum. You are here. You as an institution, as well as you who, who, who was, uh, well, uh, well, taking all this trouble of coming to this meeting and then sharing your ideas with us, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for being here and then thank you for sharing your views with us. And then I very much hope that this is just, just, just the beginning of our relationship. And I sincerely hope that uh, from now until Korea ch uh, sharing, uh, chairing the G20 meeting, as well as even beyond, I very much hope for, to engage ourselves further with the World Economic Forum as an institution, as well as you, the friends of uh, World Economic Forum, as dependable, uh, if I could say so, world opinion leaders. Thank you so much. Thank you. And let's thank the panel. Thank you. Now, in a few minutes, you will be able to get on transport to go to the President's Blue House for the reception. But before then, I'd like to ask up Mr. Richard Sammons, who is the Managing Director of the World Economic Forum. Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've reached the end of a couple of days of uh, discussion, which I hope you found as uh, stimulating and, uh, and enlightening as I have. Uh, certainly one comes away from this meeting with the clear impression that there are significant pockets of dynamism in the world economy, despite the fact that the world economy is apparently in a, technically in a recession. Uh, but what has been striking, and it's come out in this last panel, uh, is the degree to which people are not complacent, even in this part of the world where there is some dynamism in the economy, and that there is an increasing focus on the need to structurally rebalance. And if there's one message that I think does come across clearly as guidance for uh, the G20 and the Koreans uh, who will lead the process next year, is that perhaps it is time uh, now for the G20 to turn its attention from putting out the fire to thinking more structurally about how to rebalance the growth model, both in terms of a greater reliance on domestic demand in other countries beyond uh, the US, but also from the standpoint of sustainability. Uh, and I think we're only at the beginning of that discussion. My impression is that uh, the what has become clear, but the how hasn't quite become clear. It certainly hasn't uh, yet surfaced uh, with great specificity in our discussions in the forum, uh, but I expect that uh, that will be an important uh, item that will animate future discussions, including in Davos uh, next year. Now, I would like to uh, issue some thanks, uh, first to the government of Korea for being, uh, for providing such a a good partnership to engage in these discussions. And in particular, I also want to thank the uh, Federation of Korean Industries and the Korea International Trade Association be for being such uh, great collaborators uh, on this uh, meeting. Uh, Co-chairs have uh, been wonderful in their dedication, both in the, maybe perhaps you're used to seeing them in these meetings, but actually they, they contribute to some of the thinking and preparation that goes into them. And I want to thank our co-chairs very much for doing so in this respect. Uh, my colleagues at the forum have done their customary uh, excellent job. Uh, the team has been led by uh, Sushant Palakurti Rao, and if he's here, I'd like to stand, have him to stand up for a moment. 
and take our thanks. Thank you, Sushant, and thank uh, the team, uh, both the Asia team, which you had, as well as the entire family of the uh, forum employees who've contributed to the success of this meeting, as well as our colleagues, uh, Publicis Live, who uh, really perform outstandingly on a very consistent basis around the world uh, with us in putting together the production and logistics uh, for this meeting. Now, we're not quite finished, as uh, Christopher just uh, alluded to. We've been invited uh, for the closing reception by the president uh, of Korea, President Lee, uh, to go over to the Blue House. And uh, if you will uh, now uh, move out the doors to your left and up the stairs, you'll find buses waiting for you. And with that, uh, this meeting uh, is adjourned. Thank you very much.